Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 8 of my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, you saw me building and testing the Kirstock 3. And in this episode, you will be seeing that vessel and me attempting to get that thing into orbit. It'll be my first orbit, hopefully. But first, we have some other business that we need to attend to, starting with Jeb in the Otter 1, doing another one of these urban aerial survey contracts um you know i know these contracts aren't exactly the most exciting thing in the world and that's why i'm not going to be spending much time with it but uh well yeah uh oh with the materials bay yeah i do a material study here i kind of regretted doing that because one of the waypoints uh that are over the mountains there is actually very close to a desert and i could have easily um landed in the desert and picked up some science over there but there's always next time so there's no rush here but anyway like I was saying I know these certain these 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 missions are pretty dull but they are really really easy money so definitely when they come up you want to grab them it only takes me a couple of days to build uh, this plane again and uh, each time when I recover it I recover almost all my value again the only money that I ever spend is on fuel so these are pretty, pretty easy money. You definitely want to do them. But uh, there was only a couple of waypoints to pick up. One of them, unfortunately, I didn't notice at the time I picked up the contract, was above 16,800 meters. And again, the maximum altitude of this thing is only around 13 or 14 kilometers. So it's not going to be able to get up to that. But I'll just, I'll, so that's okay. I'll, I'll let that one go and uh, have to pick it up when I have a better jet. Anyway, it all went without incident, so it was just time to go back to the Kerbal Space Center. You know, and you probably noticed from my videos, I do like these shots where you kind of come out from the clouds and then see where you're coming at. I especially like them when I know that there aren't mountains that it might end up being ahead of me. So here we are coming in for another landing. And touchdown. And as we use Kerbal Construction time to time warp to the completion of our next vehicle, you might be noting the cash hit that I took uh, since the last time you saw this uh, KSC view. This is me taking away all the money that has been advanced to me because I've continually had to respawn my contracts thanks to a glitch that kept taking away my contracts but not penalizing me any money. Uh, so I think now I have my cash down to something that's a little bit more realistic of where it would have been had that glitch not happened. And by the way, I never did figure out exactly what was causing that particular problem. Um, searching around on the forums, it didn't seem like, it seemed like other people were running into it sporadically, but I, I couldn't see any pattern as far as it being connected to any particular mod. So I suspect... Um, it might just be some sort of a thing. So I'm just going to get in a habit, a good habit anyway, of just saving my game at the end of every play session uh, to a unique name so that uh, should it happen again, it would be an easy thing to simply revert. Anyway, the theme of kind of grinding over the kinds of missions we've done before uh, continues. Now with the launch of the Kirkury 3 going once again, taking one of these tourists on a uh, little little uh, tour up to space in a suborbital trajectory. Pretty routine now. This is, I think, my fourth one of these that I've done. Um, these don't net you a whole ton of cash, but what they do do is net you a lot of reputation, which at this stage of the game, this early stage, isn't doing me a lot, but it will do me, it'll give me some flexibility down the road, that's for sure. And then just a day later, the Otter 1 is ready to fly once again, and it's going to be on its way to Angard Abyss to do another one of these aerial crew reports. Now, the one thing about Angard's Abyss is, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm about two-thirds of the way, I would say, to the pole. It's a pretty good distance. It's definitely the furthest distance I've had to fly so far. So to uh, add a little insurance, I doubled up the amount of fuel on this vehicle by just simply adding another fuel can. And of course, taking out the oxidizer because uh, do not need oxidizer. We are burning the oxygen that's in the air. But the extra bit of weight 
hardly seems to affect the performance of this plane at all. Its, its stall speed is a little bit higher, so its takeoff and landing speed is a little bit higher, but uh, not that much of a deal to be really much to worry about. Its cruising altitude is a little bit lower than what it was before, but still it's getting up to a good 270 plus meters per second. I can't complain about that. Uh, so, you know, it is a bit of a distance, so it's going to be a little bit of physics warping. And just to explain for people that are new to the game, uh, the difference between physics warping and regular time warping. Um, when you are in the atmosphere, like I am right now, and you press the period button to time warp, um, you only go up to two times speed, then three times speed, then four times speed, and you, but you still have control of your vehicle. You have control of throttle, and you have control of attitude control. Um, and we call that physics warp because all the sort of physics laws are still being applied. The aerodynamics and, and, and all of that is still working on your vehicle. It's a little bit different than when you are in space. Um, if you are in space and you start pressing the period key to advance your time warp, it goes five times speed, then 10 times speed, then 50 times speed, much, much faster. But during that time, you don't have control of your vehicle. You can't adjust attitude, you can't adjust throttle. Um, so that is a non-physics warp that goes on. And there is a way to do physics warp in space. And we'll talk about that when the appropriate time comes. One thing I find with physics warping is if you go past two times speed with physics warp, uh, KSP likes to give you a little warning saying, oh, you know, well, your uh, processor might be having some issues uh, doing all the physics calculations it needs to do. And in fact, the time that's up there in the top left will start to change color from green to yellow to red. And, and that's an indication of how hard your processor is working. And if it's red, it might be missing some of its calculations, which may or may not have detrimental effects on your vehicle. So me personally, I kind of pay attention to those, uh, those, um, those warnings and only go past two time speed physics warp when uh, when there are situations where there's not a lot going on and I know I can safely go at four times speed. Anyway, uh, picking up this crew report, no issues whatsoever. Same thing with getting myself back and landing once again. These missions are becoming, despite the failing light, pretty routine by this point. And then we come to Aribe Kerman. Another VIP paying for the privilege of seeing the Kerbal Space Center from 75 kilometers up. Maybe quite not enjoying it as much as he should. But this does bring us to the end of these routine missions. No, it's time now to get on to the main event. It's time once again to try and achieve an orbit. Yes, it's time for the Curse Dock 3, and our pilot, through basic crew rotation, is going to be our newest and most cowardly pilot, Zvetlana. Now, you saw me testing this particular vehicle in the last episode, and it went up without a hitch. And one of the things that this thing has now is one of these KOS uh, scripting computer cores, which allow me to uh, run programs in it. So here I am copying the launch program over to the capsule and then it's simply a matter of running it if I can just only type launch right there we go I have to put in the heading which is going to be 90 degrees and then it's simply press enter and we are off now this particular script the only thing it does is point the rocket in the right direction it only controls attitude um, it does not control thrust, I'm in charge of that, and it does not control staging, I am also in charge of that part. So this should help me get a more efficient and predictable launch profile. Now still, Svetlana, if you look at her, she doesn't seem too impressed. Now one of the things she might not be too impressed with is the way this thing shakes. Now I, don't, I love the way this shakes actually, it does look like it's on the edge of disaster. And it just might be, because in the interim, uh, I was introduced to a new mod called Kerbal Launch Failure. And what Kerbal Launch Failure does is this. It introduces a 1 in 50 chance that on a launch, your engines are going to spontaneously begin to overheat uncontrollably and accelerate. And then they will explode, and that explosion will carry itself up through the rocket, and it's your job to save your Kerbals in that system. So, 
you best have yourself a good abort system, something that this rocket is completely lacking because I didn't have uh, I didn't have the part count for it. So <laughs> you'll be seeing a lot of abort systems in the future, but I thought that this mod, it'll add a little bit of spice, I think, to these launches because you never know quite when it will go off. Now, the mission plan is not only to achieve an orbit, but to also break that speed record of 2,500 meters per second. So it's just a matter of getting ourselves up there and seeing if we cannot achieve both of those two objectives. Now one of the things I am a bit concerned about in this mission is electricity. So I'm going to use this life support monitoring window from TAC life support to uh, take a look at the electricity. That's what I'm really looking at. The electricity remaining, which is right now at about two hours and 23 minutes. I don't have batteries unlocked on this thing, so it's just the electricity that's stored in the capsule. Now, while the engine is burning, uh, this thing is generating electricity, but the moment the engine is off, which it is now because I've reached my desired apoapsis of about 80 kilometers, I start draining the electricity. And if the electricity runs out, then I have a short period of time before my Kerbal is in a lot of trouble. So keeping track of this electricity is going to be uh, an important part of this particular mission. Now electricity is going to be an issue because uh, as I increase my orbital velocity past 2500 meters per second, I'm going to be raising my apoapsis, which is going to lengthen the period of this orbit. So I need to make sure I get Svetlana back down to the surface and oh yeah um i don't have orbital period on the uh kerbal engineer display so i might as well show how you do that it's actually pretty easy you select the window you want you hit orbital period install i'm going to push the period up there under time of apoapsis that works pretty good we'll close this window and actually we'll move this around so that this a little bit more spaced out Really like the way, and then you can. I like the way you can adjust the HUD so that uh, it's just the color of the background, so it kind of looks like that. But anyway, here we go. So I want to keep track of orbital period because if the orbital period gets longer than uh, a couple of hours, I am in a little bit of trouble when it comes to getting Svetlana back down in time. So we are closing in on our time to. Apoapsis, about 25 seconds, so we start our burn. And what I'm looking at is I is I noticed I was pushing up my time to apoapsis, so I'm gonna let myself get a little bit closer. There, start my burn again. And what I'm looking at is my time to apoapsis, so I want to keep that above zero. And of course, I'm also looking at my periapsis height. The moment that gets up above 70 kilometers, I have achieved the first part of this mission, which is to finally achieve an orbit. So, and to keep that time to apoapsis, you know, relatively close to zero, I am adjusting my throttle. I'm also adjusting um, my pitch. All right, we are now in an orbit. Hurrah! Now it's time to push up our velocity so we throttle up even further. Uh, again, uh, when I did the testing, um, I noticed at 2,500 meters per second, I didn't get that 2,500 meter per second uh, at orbital speed, sorry, of 2,500 meters per second. So I switched to surface velocity, and you can see there again, I didn't get the record at 2,500 meters per second. That's not surprising. That happened during testing as well. And I mentioned at that time that what my plan is, is to try and enter the atmosphere and go through the atmosphere at that speed. And maybe you need to be in the atmosphere in order for this record to be broken. So I pushed my apoapsis up a little bit more. My time to apoapsis is about an hour. Wait a minute, where is it? Oh, my period. That's what I'm looking at. My period is about an hour and a half. So that means it's going to take me about an hour and a half to come around back to this location. Um, and I have about two hours and 22 minutes of electricity left, decreasing pretty quickly. Um, so I turn the SAS off. And then I put my thoughts to collecting me some science. Uh, I got an EVA report over Kerbin's Highlands. And then once I passed the 250 kilometer mark, I entered into high Kerbin space. And uh, from there, I was able to do another EVA report and also get in a crew report from space high above Kerbin. So, getting some science in there as well. Anyway, once that was taken care of, it was just a matter of time warping my way 
out towards peri uh, apoapsis and reducing my periapsis to get it down into the atmosphere so I can get Svetlana back home. And here she is out over 1,400 kilometers away from Kerbin, taking in that gorgeous view. And you know, I think she might actually be starting to enjoy this whole space stuff. I decided to reduce my uh, periapsis down to 30 kilometers. That puts it well into the atmosphere. Um, because of the way I'm doing this, I'm not going to have a whole lot of control of exactly where I'm going to be putting this capsule down. I, I, I just got to kind of hope for the best. Um, because I don't want to get into mucking around with my orbit because well, main reason, again, because of electricity. I want to get her down pretty quickly and make sure that electricity doesn't end up becoming any kind of a problem whatsoever. Um, one mod that can help with this is called the Trajectories mod, which I do have installed, but until you get patch conics and maneuver nodes and those kind of things working, uh, which happens when you upgrade the tracking station, um, Trajectories mod is not going to work. So it's of no use to me right now. Uh, but you will be seeing it in a future episode. So yeah, I have to do a little bit of correction burning back uh, prograde to raise my periapsis up to 30 because I overburnt it the first time. And now let's see, I got time to periapsis is about 42 and a half minutes. I got over an hour of electricity left. I think I'm going to be okay for getting her down in time. So we time warp our way around to periapsis, still keeping a close look on our electricity. I noticed that the scriptable control system has a little bit of electricity in it. So what I decided to do is to use a little bit of the uh, TAC fuel balancer. It's not just fuel and oxidizer that you can move around with it. You can also move around electricity just to get every last kilojoule of electric charge into the Mark I command capsule. There we go. And I didn't notice in mucking around with all of this, I got myself into the atmosphere without really noticing that I had done this. So I turned myself as per normal to uh, one of the normal vectors and release the ascent stage. And whoa, a little bit spinny there. That's okay, that's because I had the SAS off. We put ourselves onto the retrograde vector. We turn our SAS off again to conserve electricity and the fact that we no longer need it because now aerodynamics will keep this thing oriented in the right direction. And now I am watching my speed again. I still got that 2500 meter per second speed record to, to try and beat. And you can see that my surface velocity is well over that. I'm now over 2680 meters per second well over the 25 meters 2500 meters per second and well into the atmosphere my altitude is now below 45 kilometers and oh my gosh take a look at Svetlana is that a smile on her face that certainly is good golly we're gonna make an Kerbinot out of her yet anyway yeah it doesn't look like I'm going to be getting that speed record after all. I think I would have gotten it by now. I'm wondering if the whole idea is that you're suborbital, like like that you've done a launch and you're you're not in an orbit getting this speed, but you're just you know uh, launching and getting up to that speed. So uh, that should be easy enough, just to launch and stay suborbital and just get up to that 2,500 meters per second. In fact, I got some missions in mind in the future that will likely end up doing that naturally, so that turns out not to be a big deal. Um, I guess one of the things I could have done was to uh, lower my periapsis right down into Kerbin's surface, uh, and that would have made me suborbital. I wonder if that would have tripped off this speed record. I'm, I'm a little bit glad I didn't do it, because to be honest, I, I don't want to muck too much with the atmospheric re-entry effects. I mean, I don't know, I don't want to come in in too steep a trajectory dropping from too high an altitude just to test to see, oh, what will happen? How far do I have to push it before I end up blowing things up? I'd rather not find out myself. So, uh, Svetlana spent a long time decelerating, and taking a look at this, it's looking like... I might just end up landing in the deserts, which are not only flat, but a biome that I have yet to visit. So uh, that's pretty exciting. I see I got a lot of the blader, blader left. 
So I likely could have come in steeper. And oh, look at that, a crew report. That must be over the desert. Let's check out this crew report. Yeah, crew report flying over the desert. Excellent, the EVA report. Obviously, I'm not going to perform at this point. That would be rather silly. The rest of the descent went without incident. And as I could see coming up, I did land in the desert. Nice flat stretch of desert. And that allowed Svetlana to get out there and collect herself a reasonably healthy chunk of science from a biome that we have yet to get to. That mission ended up netting us 45.5 science, now up to 127. Uh, got some funds back, not a lot. And so Atlanta becomes our first pilot to reach level 1. Uh, still don't have enough money to upgrade the vehicle assembly building, which is my next contact, our uh, next target. But I really want to take a look at these contracts, and there are two that are catching my attention. One is to do a low-resolution scan over Kerbin. This is coming from the ScanSat contracts. Uh, that one is pretty tempting. The other one, though, it, that I really kind of like is the test the LV-1 ant engine in a suborbital trajectory over the moon. I, I really like this idea. Um, uh, I, I, I want to get to the moon. <laughs> so I got into orbit, and now I'm ready to go somewhere else. So let's go to the moon. And I like this one because, uh, yeah, you know, it's, all I got to do is hit it, right? All I got to do is hit the moon and on my way down test the ant engine. Well, it's not quite as simple as that um, because I do have remote tech in, in, installed, and this will give me a good opportunity to talk about remote tech. But I'm looking at that hundred almost 118,000 curve bucks that I'll get upon completion. And the other thing I noted as well is this one expires in only three hours while the low resolution scans of Kerbin expires in three days. And that's what ended up prompting me to just take this one right now. I should be able to get in another mission before three days are up and pick up the low resolution scan one too. Oh, yeah. But those are obviously going to have to be for future episodes. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.